Greetings, cultivators from around the world. Jordan River here with more Growcast. Here when you need me, reliably. Today we have the great Dr. Coco back on the line. You know Dr. Coco. You love Dr. Coco. It's educational April. Today we are educating ourselves on scaling up, the process of scaling up your garden and what that means, the differences between these large grows and small grows, the limitations. We get into things like labor cost. You know, material cost, how they differ, experimentation. It's a really cool episode, and you know we talk lights. Before we get into it, though, with Dr. Coco, shout out, speaking of lights, shout out to Photon Tech Lighting, baby. Growcastpodcast.com slash photon will bring you right there. Code Growcast saves you 10% off on your powerful and efficient LED grow light fixtures. They have the 465 watt, perfect for a 4x4. They've got the 600 watt, perfect for a 5x5. They've got the 1,000-watt CO2, which is one of the most powerful fixtures on the market. That's a bad boy. And then for the smaller growers, they even have the Square 3 and the Square 2 for the smaller tents. Code GROWCAST, again, saves you money. Send us a screenshot of your code. You're automatically entered to win seeds. And get that sexy red photon tech. These magnetic bars are a lifesaver. I talk about it a little bit in the episode. I just moved, and taking this thing apart and packing it up was absolutely awesome. It worked like a charm. It was so much easier to move than if it was all stuck together, even if it folds, let alone if it doesn't fold. These magnetic bars are where it's at. Easy to disassemble and reassemble. Easy to hang. Uh, High quality stuff at Photon Tech. Five-year warranty. Watertight. uh, Magnetic bars. High efficiency. What more do you want? Growcastpodcast.com slash photon. Code Growcast. Use it and send us a screenshot. All right, let's get into it with Dr. Coco. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to Growcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in again today to the Growcast podcast, baby. Before we get started, as always, I urge you, share this show, turn a grower on a Growcast podcast, and check out our membership, our little secret society of growers, growcastpodcast.com slash membership for bonus content, live streams, archives, uh, community giveaways, and so much more. See you there, everybody. Today, we are on the line with Dr. Coco. What's up, Dr. Coco? Hey, Jordan. Yes, it's Sweet. good to be back on Growcast. It's been a while, actually, since, since we've done one of these, and it's been the first time I'm getting to talk to you since we got to meet in person out for the San Diego meetups. So Man, that fun was fun. To be back. I'm not going to lie. That was a lot of fun. It was like uh, we didn't have very much time to promote it. It was kind of impromptu, but damn, if we didn't have two, three dozen people show up throughout the night, it was really, really fun, really intimate, and uh, thank you for coming down, Coco. Dr. Coco was there on the scene. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. Um, you know, it's been the first time since I've done some things since we all went into lockdown like that. So it was uh, nice to get out and sort of socialize with some other cannabis enthusiasts. And uh, of course, to get to meet the, the famous Jordan River. So. <laughs> yeah, just uh, not quite as exciting in real life, as, am I? Um, shout, out, <laughs> shout out to all the SoCal uh, listeners and members, though, man. So much fun down there. Panda and uh, Eleanor was out there and shout out to Metal Flowers and... Um, Sun God Seeds and so many more. If, I, if I'm forgetting you, it's not because I'm forgetting you. Love you all. Too too many to list here. But yeah, Coco, you're all over the place, man. What the hell? You're like out in the Southeast. You're consulting now. Dr. Consult. What is this? <laughs> oh, yeah, I've done I've done some consulting work for a while. But yeah, I'm working with a, a few grows setting up and, you know, helping them plan out their operations and think through the challenges and develop cultivation plans and all that really cool man i mean i know there's i'm sure there's confidentiality agreements but is it safe to say that you're working with some very large scale cannabis producers in very emerging markets is that safe to say sure and you know in the industry they're probably not considered very large scale but certainly to our audience i think they'd be considered very large scale <laughs> bigger than um, a grow tent in your house is that then it's, yeah it's, it's Indeed. Um, you know, a lot of the issues about cultivation are the same at different scales, but a lot of them really change as, as you scale up. Um, and so thinking through issues in, in different size spaces like that, um, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to sort of think about how to optimize a grow operation, how to optimize growing plants, but then also sort of the flow of the operation and the overall cultivation plan. And to think through a lot of, you know, the issues, the science stays the same, but the conditions change. And so each grow, each commercial grow, each grow room is a little bit different. So 
thinking about, um, you know, laying out the room in terms of taking maximum advantage of the space, but also having good workflow. You don't want to make it too difficult for the workers in the room to sort of move around for us gardeners, right? Yeah. A lot of interesting thoughts like that and different ways to, to do estimates, you know, a different way to sort of approach planning and, uh, it's it's cool. I like it. We've been thinking a lot. I'd imagine. Well, you know, labor is such a different thing. I think comparing it, comparing a commercial grow to sort of a home grow, that's one of the the real bigger differences. Home growers are using their own labor and they're not sort of paying themselves an hourly wage. So their labor is essentially free. Oftentimes they experience drudgery associated with it. So there's sort of like a, a drudgery cost. But more often, I think, you know, home growers enjoy it and they get sort of benefits out of that. So the labor costs are just totally different. We kind of think about our grows in that regard differently. When you're running it as a business, you're paying people to work. You have, you know, a very different set of, of calculations to consider. And, you know, I did a lot of work in that. My academic work um, has looked quite closely at, at peasant economics and farmers that grow primarily for themselves and how they sort of exist in the world around them. And that's a huge sort of difference between peasant farming, which all of us home growers really are, and commercial farming. And understanding sort of those economic differences is really important for commercial sort of operations to interact with peasants and important for peasants to be able to interact with sort of commercial farmers. Talk to me more about that. Like, what are the what are the theories of peasant economics? How do you see that applying to the cannabis workforce? And what do you think about the cannabis workforce in general? You know, people being paid $200 per pound to trim when I lived in Humboldt County, and now they'll just give someone 12 bucks an hour here, go trim. What do you think of labor in the industry? <laughs> well, there's the questions that are sort of affiliated with um, unskilled labor or low skilled labor in general and sort of fair compensation for low skilled labor is a, a huge thorny socio-political sort of question. I think that would take us pretty far away from, from <laughs> some of the a lot concerns. of angry emails. It's just, it's a shock to see, man. Like I said, it's $200 a pound going down to $12 an hour. It's bring in the, the master grower, get everything running and then give him the boot. And just replace, yeah. replace him with a well, the two hundred dollars a pound wage was supported by the you know the market and the legal regime. That yes, the, market was the risk. In. It was supported by the risk. Exactly, and as the risks change, you know, oftentimes the, the motivation to change laws is to lower the cost of labor, and, and that's certainly what happens in these situations when you take the the legal risk off the table then you no longer have to pay people as much money as you did when they are under legal risk to do it that doesn't sort of fully resolve the question of sort of what's the fair wage right. um <laughs> but in you know capitalism the wage that we pay to low skilled workers is set by the competition for those jobs it's not set by the the contribution that they do to the company that they work for. It's not based on sort of how much value they add. It's based on their replacement costs. So what it would cost to hire somebody else to do that job, irrespective of the value that they add, that's sort of the way labor works in capitalism. And that becomes, you know, what happens in these kinds of situations. <laughs> I love your tone. It's somewhere between uh, like knowing and diplomatic and uh, just scratching the surface. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm almost sort of trying to scratch the surface. This is this really is. This is an a, hour a or two. Yeah. Lecture. Well, I mean, Procast you, you want to get into to we'll David it. Ricardo and Karl Marx yeah, and Adam right. Smith and, and, you know, Keynesian economics and things like this. I mean, how... How deep into that sort of political economic economy of this welcome should to, we go? Yeah. But welcome to these are podcasts. issues that have motivated political philosophers for centuries. I mean, the question of you know distribution and allocative efficiency within a, an economy, within a market economy. It's you know questions arousing around this issue is literally responsible for the rise of the social sciences. 
as academic disciplines in, in Western academic history. It's the reason why people started studying economics and sociology and all, all the rest of that was to sort of wrap their heads around these things. So to say that this is a, a, a big question is like understated at least. This is the question and that sort of has motivated much of, of social science well, for you know over a hundred years. Just like the research behind agriculture in general, just like the research behind cannabis and medicine and medicine in general, as the great method man said, cash rules everything around me. So when you get this cash crop, right, all of these classroom theories, the rubber starts meeting the road. You know what I mean? Like you, you start yeah. to see it happen. And, and when you get this cash crop and it blows up and people want control and, and all of these things are moving and shaking and laws are changing, that's when you really see, like, again, the theories be put to test at a human scale. Yeah. And, and cannabis, this example is sort of so remarkable because – you know, a few times in, in literally the course of human history has a product come into the market like this, where it's already a well-known commodity with a high demand, a relatively low cost of production, right. and absolutely sort of no pre-existing, you know, regulated market or big institutional players. So the the sort of legal economic side of it just started for like this brand new product, but it's not a brand new product. It's something that everybody already knows a lot about and already really wants and anybody can grow and the cost of production are relatively low. This is sort of a unique moment in, in human history, you could argue for some reasons, to be able to observe some of these market dynamics in play in, in real world operation. And you see a lot of it. You're seeing the, the sort of outside money rushing into the investment opportunities. You're seeing massive consolidation in certain sectors of the market. Right. A lot of that sort of classic market behavior that just ramped up. But the low barriers to entry pending different sort of legal regimes that are set up you know, this isn't like going, starting a cannabis farm isn't like, you know, producing your own brand of car in terms of like how much upfront capital it takes to, to get an yes. operation off the ground. So the barriers to entry are a lot lower, potentially opening sort of this to a, a more competitive field. But That's you're crazy. also going to have, you have sky high prices in a lot of cases, either set by a history of prohibition or regulatory regimes. I don't know, there's a lot of interesting forces at play at sort of the macroeconomic scale of the cannabis industry. I do want to rein it back in though, because like you said- <laughs> You see, I knew it. I, I'm like- <laughs> No, dude, that was <laughs> Yeah, but go. Let me be clear, that was perfect. That was, that was the perfect amount of tangent. And, and bringing yeah. it back around though, the labor is what you were focusing in on in that difference between small scale and large scale. That seems to be a glaring difference, uh, like you said, maybe the right, the difference right. there. But there are other ones too. You were mentioning, you know, it's not just the person working in the garden, but the garden itself. In terms of how it's different. Well, for instance, you were talking about uh, how lighting would differ in, yeah. in a scenario like that. So again, you're talking about labor affecting not only the profitability and sustainability of the garden, but also yep. the skill level of the gardener. Right. Yeah. Um, Which is uh, arguably higher amongst the peasant class than it is amongst the capitalist class. I mean, not even arguably, I think. Meaning the home grown. Monstrably. Yeah, exactly. So and they, they care more and they have a, a, you know, better, you know, worker to a square footage of crop ratio, which are really important sort of factors in terms of, of quality of gardening. So home growers have a lot of advantages over commercial growers in that space. Commercial growers have a lot of advantages in terms of economies of scale. And, but it, it's interesting. So lighting specifically, but even before we get into that, let's think about sort of that the labor issue in terms of maximization, because home growers, when, I, when I'm saying, you know, we're going to maximize your, your grow, I think every single home grower would think that we're going to be goal, gearing for like the largest possible harvest, right? And you would achieve that sort of goal on the scale. And that would be like the only sort of arbiter of whether you had reached your goal was, was just the scale. If you're talking about maximization in sort of a commercial horticulture sense, you're talking about profit 
not just revenue. You're not just talking about sort of yield, but how expensive was it to get that yield? Yes. You know, so are you talking about maximizing your returns to the space and is space or the facility or rent sort of the, the limiting factor on your, your growth? So you want to maximize returns to space? Are you maximizing your returns to labor? Are you maximizing your returns to sort of your, your capital investment? So they're going to be thinking about maximization sort of in a very different way with, with lots of different sort of in inputs and outputs and, and pluses and minuses. Whereas home growers the, the, from the sort of peasant set will just think about it in terms of their production. So that feeds into how you think about a, a lot of the different aspects of the grow in a commercial facility once you're using people for starters and to developing a labor plan you want to make sure that you know you're going to be productively using your workforce and that you spread out sort of the cultivation plan and the labor requirements so that there aren't certain days when you need 50 people and other days where you need two um, you need to figure out sort of how to manage cultivation in terms of managing your labor supply at the same time. You know, home growers face some of that, those issues, like when do my lights turn on and off? When do I get home from work type of issues? But it's a lot easier to, to sort of coordinate that and you're not sort of judging it against an overall kind of efficiency in the same way. Man. Um, yeah, it seems well, like across the board. Yeah. Well, one of the interesting things in my research with peasant farmers in Latin America, for one of the projects I was working on, I was tracking how many hours farmers spent per crop, all the way from sort of the, the initial work they did preparing the field after the last harvest, separating seeds, choosing seeds, and planting the, the field, all the work they did during that cultivation season there through the harvest, through the processing, and up to the point of marketing that, that produce to, to understand better their labor costs. They didn't keep track of any of that stuff themselves. So there weren't sort of other records and it, it required a, <laughs> it was, it, you know, I mean, I'm sure it sounds pretty complicated, but it was even more complicated than that. It's like, you know, farmers and I would go with them and they'd go out to their fields and there wouldn't be a lot to do. And they'd kind of sit there for a while and maybe they'd wander through the fields and they kind of look at their plants a little bit and then they'd go back, sit in the shade and, you know, have something to eat and maybe go in and check on the pump or something like this. But, you know, it's not productive. And if you were a capitalist farm, you certainly wouldn't be paying somebody to be as idle as they would be on those sort of down days. Right. So how do you account for that? Should I account for that as a day of work? I mean, he spent the day there, but like he kind of spent the day there because like that's what he does every day. You know, it's not because like there was a lot of work to do, but like, you know, if he had stayed at home, his wife would have put him to work. So he went to the field. Like, I mean, how do you, how do you account for that? It's just a, a totally different kind of way of thinking about work. And when you're working for yourself in your own garden, you're not thinking about like what your hourly wage would be or like how expensive your labor is um, just ever because it's usually because it's something you like to do. So, right. yeah, that's Again, it's like everything is like that, right? Like you're so right about the labor cost. That is that is the that is the biggest differentiator when we're talking about these differences. But imagine like more specifically, like a specific strategy, like let's say your soil. Let's take a look at your medium, replacing your medium in a home grow versus replacing your medium. <laughs> Huh. I mean, the facilities are designed for the medium that, that they're going to be growing with. Yeah. Or like, you know, if you got to throw away your soil, if you're growing one plant, throwing away your soil and getting fresh soil is like, that's nothing. But at scale, it, that could ruin your business, you know? Yeah. No, you're talking, you know, pallets worth and if it's really expensive. So those, the input into a, a commercial facility, the grow media is, is one of the biggest sort of inflows. I mean, that's one of the reasons you need to have sort of a, a shipping and receiving bay is to get the, the new shipment of media. But, you know, whether or not you have a potting room or how big the potting room is and how, you know, what kind of equipment you have in there is all geared towards your, your grow media that you're planning to grow with. And, you know, a facility that's designed to grow in Rockwell, for example, probably won't even have a potting room. They'll just have their, their clone room and, and bring their Rockwell cubes in there and then into their veg room or flower rooms or wherever they go from there. But they're not going to have an, even an area in the building to like 
mixed media or poor media and pots and stuff. And so, yeah, it'd be, it's a lot harder. And, you know, some facilities are designed for a little bit of flex and flexibility in some of those things. But the media plan layout is actually, you know, something that you'd want to think through in advance. And the, the issue is always to maximize the flower space within the, the grow building. So you don't want to build a, a big room that you don't use. You can't just sort of have that flexibility in your operation. Home growers can swap out and experiment and things like this. For sure. I did want to talk more about, again, like the, kind of this link to, to kind of segue it. When you got the $15 people an hour work in the plants, you better have had somebody who set it up right. You said uh, lighting at a large scale, right? I'm sure that the uh, distribution of light completely changes. You've talked about like raising the lights and things like that. Yeah. It be set up proper at scale. I don't yeah. know. Maybe you can tell me. I was about to say I feel like there's less room for error, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe there's actually more room for error. You tell me. Oh, there's a lot more room for error because, you know, uh, it depends on who, who you're, you're dealing with in terms of your light consultants on these things. Because a lot of the operations have outside capital. They're not the experts on this. So they often hire in sort of consultants. And oftentimes they just hire in sort of dealers and brokers who are interested in selling them a lot of light. So there's two basic philosophies for how you grow, uh, how you light a space. You either light the benches or you light the room. And if you go in expecting to only light the benches, then you really have to think through that cultivation strategy, the lighting strategy, how big the plants you're going to get, how the space is laid out. One of the issues with um, just lighting the benches is you're going to have to run your lights much closer to your crop and you're going to have a less even distribution of light. There's always going to be a drop off as, you know, it approaches the edge of like the aisle that's not going to be lit. The alternative, which I always recommend, is to light the room and then maximize the bench space within the room. That allows you to, to put the lights higher, but you have to allocate light, you know, to the whole space, not just to the, the areas that have the plants. And, you know, the bench space efficiency is usually, you know, in an inefficient layout, it can be as low as 50%. In a really efficient layout, you can get, you know, like 80, 85% if you have rolling benches and you can minimize aisles. But there's interesting sort of trade-offs and calculations there. Of course, you also have to think about, well, what's your target PPFD? In a grow tent, Target PPFD should almost always be under 1,000. I mean, your maximum PPFD should be 1,000. And in a grow tent, you're going to have this sort of, you know, a distribution of a drop off as it goes into the corners and out towards the sides. Fixtures are certainly getting better about lighting their intended coverage area. And I'm like really impressed with some of the latest fixtures I've been testing in that regard. But there's always going to be that drop off. In sort of contrast, in a big open space where you fully budgeted enough light for that entire space, almost the whole room will be at the average PPFD. And there's not going to be sort of strong points or hot spots and, and weak spots. You're going to have that whole plant room at the average PPFD. And the thing I think that surprises a lot of home growers is it's not going to matter how high you hang the lights because you know, the light is filling the space. So the higher they are above the canopy, like the more it'll spread out across that canopy from each individual fixture. But since all the other fixtures are spreading light back, it, it's a total wash. So in a fully lit grow room where you've lit the space, you can hang your lights, you know, eight feet above the plants. And that becomes a lot easier to like work under and stuff. You're not banging your head or having to lift them or raise them as the crop grows and all of these other things. So there's like a, a more light you're going to have to be buying, but you're going to get a better distribution and you're going to end up doing less work, you know, around the plants, you pay for less labor. And in a commercial operation, you got to budget all that out and think like, okay, well, how much more light, how much is that much more light? And now I can put this much more benching. How much is that going to get me in more harvest? And how much is that harvest going to be worth? And how much more am I going to have to pay the workers in order to, to achieve that? 
sort of larger harvest, you know, all of these different sets of calculations. Right. Man, I'm glad that I'm not in your shoes. I mean, I think it's awesome doing consulting and large scale consulting and stuff like that, especially because you probably feel confident having dealt with, you know, corn and things like that. It's got to be harder than cannabis. No, what I'm saying is, well, it's it's different. Corn is certainly different. But yeah, I mean, I've been around cannabis now for quite a while, too. So, yeah, I'm just poking fun at that part. But what I mean is that's got to be quite a bit of pressure, man. Like you're walking into these these grows. And again, it's not someone's home garden where if you give them bad advice, they can go find another consultant. No kidding. Yeah, I take it very seriously. That's cool, man. That's that's really cool. Take it very seriously and really pretty high pressure. Yeah, I really think through, you know, the plan and how it's going to work and, you know, make sure you have the space that you need, make sure that you have the equipment that you need in that space. And at the same time, you know, not have much more than you need. You don't want to have, you know, a bunch of sort of space in a mother room that you don't need. For example, you want the mother room to be sized appropriately for the cultivation space. And thinking through that and, and, you know, that whole cultivation plan really requires, you know, running through the whole operation and understanding flow and all that. So it's fun. I mean, I love sort of the systems level thinking through the, the processes like that. You know, I've seen enough sort of problems in other operations that we can head off and avoid and and of good ideas from different operations. It's really fun to get to, you know, do something right from the first time and not sort of come in and correct mistakes. I've done a lot of actual old sort of spot consulting work in the past for some commercial grows that are all about sort of like, we're having this problem. Can you help us fix this problem? It's a lot better, I've, I think, to come in with like, how can we do this right from the start? Right. I would love to talk about some of those problems that you've run into really quick before that, though. What if this large scale grow wants to grow nothing but Blue Dream? We'll be right back with Dr. Coco. But before that, we're going to tell you about Plant Revolution, baby. PlantRevolution.com. Code GROWCAST is live. We didn't used to have a code. Now we have a code you're going to want to go and use it this month. Pick up some microbes from plantrevolution.com and use code GROWCAST. Why? Because one code user is automatically entered to win a GROWCAST sweet pack. We're celebrating one year with plant success, and we're giving away to one code user a GROWCAST t-shirt, a GROWCAST coffee mug, a pack of GROWCAST Seed Co. seeds, and our very last GROWCAST smoker swag pack with the GROWCAST grinder, the Wolfman rolling tray, and the GrowCast jar. Super, super cool. Go into one code user, pick up a little bottle of microbes, pick up something, plantrevolution.com. Loving their beneficial bacteria, king crab, their liquid mycorrhiza and bacteria, orca. Pick up the orca if you haven't tried it. Or feed all your microbes with their myco chum, high quality of molasses and micronutrients and some other goodies in there to feed your biology, baby. Love that myco chum. Try that in your garden if you're a living soil gardener. You will not regret it. Let me know your results. I know you're going to love it. And of course, their great white myco powder. All at plantrevolution.com. All code GROWCAST. Use it this month to be entered to win big, baby. And one member is going to win a GROWCAST wish. All right, let's get back to it with Dr. Coco. I would love to talk about some of those problems that you've run into. Really quick before that, though. What if this large-scale grow wants to grow nothing? but blue dream you have to plan that out well in advance because (laughs) that means your whole other rooms they just fly over your head didn't you say that you hate well (laughs) you got a bunch of flack you know i love how you answered the straight face you tease me about blue dream so much yeah i kind of i kind of just let that fly because (laughs) a lot of people bring this damn strain up jordan but um, the reason I tease you much so much is because the members tease me so much. I didn't know it made such an impact on. Them. I thought we were allowed to say which strains that we cared for and didn't. And then people are saying, "I guess I, I just alienated I like a bunch food. of people." <laughs> Not at all. Yes, I you know, I think I mentioned this before, but I wanted it to be an uplifting strain, and it was a sleepy strain, which I guess I probably could have deduced <laughs> by the dream in the name. 
but um, now, he's, now he's defending himself. You don't gotta defend yourself. I'm just I'm just playing, man. Um, yeah, no, I should probably. I have thought this for a while. Everybody loves this thing so damn much. I'm probably just being biased against it, so I should get over it. But, we'll smoke. We'll smoke. Um, it was an interesting question. What you asked for the reason that I was sort of answering, at least in my mind, it was because you got to think through that in terms of the mothers. I mean, if you're going to be growing your plants from clones, then you need to have the mother capacity to support the number of clones that you want for each strain that you want to grow out. And, right. you know, if you're a lot of facilities set up on two week rotations, so if you're going to be stripping clones every two weeks, you're going to have to have, you know, quite depending on how large your operation is, you're going to have to have quite a, a bit of square footage in blue dream mothers in order to accomplish that vision of your world. And that's one of the other sort of things that you have to think through in terms of flexibility as a commercial operation and efficiency. How much redundancy do you want in the mother room? Like, do you just want enough space to be able to support the number of cuttings you need every two weeks? And if you minimize it down to that, then that means you're going to be growing the same mix of plants every two weeks because you're going to have to take cuttings from all of your mothers every two weeks. And, you know, if all the mothers have the same variety, that might be fine. But if you're going to try to respond to sort of consumer behavior and what's selling and stuff like that, it's really helpful to have some sort of surplus mother capacity so you can switch that around. And, you know, you need some for basic crop rotation in the mother space anyway. So I don't know, there's all sorts of, of things like that, that for a home grower growing seeds, you just buy whatever seeds you want the next time, but it takes months of planning to be able to, to sort of take that kind of transition in a large commercial operation, especially one that's gonna be, you know, running a, a sog grower, a lot of plants, you know, growers that they're operations that grow fewer plants and larger plants can afford to be a little bit more nimble on, you know, that side of things because they have to take fewer cuttings, but they're less efficient other points of the operation. So planning out the correct cultivation strategy for that depends on understanding like local laws and labor and all sorts of things in that regard too. There's not even sort of a one size fits all approach to the best way to, to do out a commercial facility like that because all of them face their own individual issues. Yeah, no kidding, man. I'm glad to be a home grower in that sense. But again, still really cool. I would love to come see any of these grows anytime you want to partner or do a vlog. Obviously, that is on the table, man. That would be really, really cool. Um, you got to keep us up to date on all that stuff. Yeah, no, I, for sure. There is some travel involved, but I think maybe we could, we could set that up at some point in the future. I'll have to see. That'd be fun, man. I do want to get to this last point for sure. I know we don't have as much time today. Me and Coco always talk off air and we chew up a bunch of time. But uh, yeah, this we'll was be- a new set of topics. I hope this one was interesting to your, your audience. Oh, of course, so, man. I'll see. What, what do you got? What's the last one? I'm, I'm excited for the last question. What well, here's the thing. That's perfect. If you think that that kind of labor and uh, labor focused stuff was a little bit off the wall, we're going to bring it right back to grow lights. So that's that's perfect. Anyways, man, we'll talk about the classic stuff. We do a little bit of something new and a little bit of the classics. You know, it's like a good arrow. Sure. Answer. So Aerosmith, what a bad example for that. <laughs> so, uh, so I wanted to talk to you about. I let you slide on so much, man. I've got to start being a little bit harder. Yeah, you should have pounced on that, man. Yeah, I was yeah. for that. I, I gave myself some shit for that, but I was thinking classic. And my mind went yeah. classic rock. And then I was like, classic rock band. I was like, oh no, I should have done something current. <laughs> um, <laughs> shit. Speaking of classic and current, speaking of currents, <laughs> Grow lights, man, and grow light trends. This is something that came up on the show recently. I've got some big thoughts on the way that grow light technology is going to evolve, not from a technical perspective. I'm sure you'll be able to give us the lowdown on that, but what do you think as we evolve, man? Oh, and real quick, just. just well, hell, I'm curious what you think now. What do you okay. think? Sure. Yeah. I'll give you, I'll give you two things. First, I'll give you a, a story and then uh, sure. I'll give you what I think. I did just move and. You know, people ask me, what's the best grow light all the time. And lately I've been answering in the same way that you and I kind of deduced on one of the recent episodes. Of course, we have our partners with our Growcast codes, but what you really want to do is find one on sale. If you can find one on sale that stacks with the discount code, 
even better because that is a home grower that's really gonna give you the head start that you need as long as with the caveat like coco said last time with the caveat that it is a high performing light and not somehow underperforming on its claims you know what i mean yeah. get a high-end light on sale and you're gonna be good to go that's how i've been answering yep yeah and though, i always try to make sure that the the as far as i work with we'll set up their sales so our discount codes will stack and you guys get those sort of the best deals possible nice. so and this is a good season for that, right? 420 sales are coming up. Um, so, oh, you know, if the audience is is in the market, start paying attention to, to what's going on in, in that space for sure. I agree with that. Well, I got an um, caveat though, really quick, man, because I just, yeah. I just moved again. And yeah. man, this was a fucking struggle, getting everything in the tent, everything from the house in the trailer. Yeah, moving, I mean, resetting up a grow is, is a pain. Well, I got to tell you, man, these magnetic fucking bars, these magnetic bars are yeah. really, really nice. I broke this thing down and it fit into a nice box. Some of these really nice bars that are very affordable are bulky. They're bulky as shit. They're hard to move. They fold. Some of them don't even fold. And it's just this big yes. U UFO thing. And yeah. that's really hard to work with. So another caveat is if you're going to move once or even twice before the end of this grow lights lifespan, you might want to opt for the magnetic bars like are on the photon tech, of course, code Growcast. I'm holding one in my hands right now, but uh, the magnetic bars are, are a huge plus. I know other companies do it too. I don't want to just say that photon tech has the market corner. I want to say that a think grow does magnetic bars. There are others, but yeah, huh? dude, the magnetic bar. I wasn't aware of the think bar fixture that had magnets, but yeah, I think well, I agree with you there. I definitely prefer fixtures that disassemble to those that fold. It, you know, this it, is all just a matter of shipping and storage. And the fixtures that disassemble are cheaper to ship. And let's just think about that for a second. Shipping actually represents a pretty big cost to grow light manufacturers. I didn't even think about um, that. Both shipping the, the lights to their warehouses and then the shipping that gets, you know, to you. And yeah, they say free shipping, but you're paying for that in the unit price. Exactly. And if it's cheaper for them, and you pay the same price, you can get a better light basically by getting a fixture that disassembles. This is one of the ways that manufacturers are able to cut their costs that they pass on to you when they're using the same number of diodes, and the same drivers and the same build quality and the construction of the materials and all the rest of that. So I definitely think you get a sort of more bang for your buck in, in a lot of these cases with that, especially if they're sort of, you know, that's one of the side-by-side -side options. So for sure, I, I agree with that. And it makes it easier for you, like you're saying, when you have to move. But the fact that it makes it cheaper for the manufacturers and saves everybody money or allows them to invest more money into the product itself. I did not realize that, man. That is very, very interesting. Yeah, no, um, shipping fees are a big part of their margins. Um, it definitely affects the, the grow light companies. And going, and going to the warehouse or going to the distributor or whatever, if it's not assembled, then they're going to have to assemble it. So there's more labor. But if the photon tech or whatever just breaks down, you can ship it and then distribute it. That actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So the box ends up being much smaller. So less storage fits into smaller shipping containers, less um, warehouse to customer shipping charges. And yeah, it saves, it, it saves quite a bit on that side, which again, wow. it just means that for the same price, you're going to get a better light yeah, over one that you know, is harder to ship and, and store and all the rest of that. Um, um, I did want to say, though, my my thoughts on the future. I think that uh, obviously custom customization and things like that, kind of like we just discussed, are big. But what I think is going to be biggest is kind of going the way that like Apple did with the smartphone, which is yeah. intu intuitive design and like better guided user interfaces. You take a look at the Metagrow smart, and I think that that's going to be the future. I think that I think that uh, when someone comes along and takes a look at these external controllers and they're kind of bulky and they don't operate like a, like a normal OS would. I think when someone gets a really intuitive guided user interface where it's just flower mode button, veg mode button, real simple to use. I think that's where it's headed on that front. Yep. And, you know, I think that you could set something up with that with also, you know, have a tab for advanced settings, right? and let people make more fine-tuned controls totally. than that if they wanted to. But um, I agree. I think app interfaces, people like to have um, that sort of feedback to onboard displays. One of the things that 
I think is a, a limitation for some fixtures is um, the way they set up the dimmer and being able to use like an app controller or an onboard display to sort of overcome some of those obstacles. The two common types of dimmers are those that are continuously variable and you get to just kind of like point it in the right direction and hope you're getting the setting right. Or those that lock into position at, you know, 20 or 25% increments. And both of those aren't sort of super convenient because one of the trends that I'm definitely observing in the home grow side of things is growers are using more and more light. Fixtures are being designed with more and more sort of top end capacity. There's increasingly manufacturers that are marketing fixtures to only be run at you know, 75%, 80% of their capacity, not even to go up to 100% capacity. And the idea there is once you have sort of plenty of light to be able to more specifically dial in the needs to your garden. So there are two trends, one's lagging the other. The sort of leading trend is grow lights are becoming less expensive, enabling growers to afford more light enabling them to now have more light than they may need and requiring many of them to run at less than 100% power. That's the, the sort of driving factor here. The lagging one is what you're talking about, you know, having better controls for that and sort of more reliable controls. So, you know, doing it through uh, an app or an onboard display that, that sort of allows you to set precise increments and know how much power you're giving to your, oh, okay. your crop in the context that growers have now more light than they necessarily need. Okay. On that note, I have a, I have a little question for you. I saw a recent, uh, it's not recent by now. It's probably like a year old. I saw a post by uh, our mutual friend, Shane from Migro about uh -huh. the, about the apps on your phone that detect light and how most of them are pretty inaccurate. But then he posted this one hack where like you get the photon app, like a very specific app and you diffuse it with a piece of paper and you do it a certain way and you can get kind of a decent reading. Did you see this post? Are you still skeptical? What do you think of um, using a phone to read these light levels? Hmm. Did you not see that post? It, you know, yeah, no, I know. I mean, I, I sort of know about this and I've been asked about it from a lot of people and I struggled to come up with the, sort of the best diplomatic answer on this question, but I don't concur so with his opinion about the accuracy of the, the photon app or, There's nothing wrong with or really of the, the ability of it to... So when I tested it, because I tested the same app, the same sensor, um, and I tried with the diffuser and I tried um, with different kinds of paper, um, all sorts of things like that, the reading would not remain consistent from in different places within the canopy. So vis-a-vis -vis my, my Apogee sensor. So in the center of the canopy, I could make calibrations to get the sensors to be roughly equivalent or at least to be, you know, have a known no multiplier to be able to, to sort of what's the difference here. But when you move ball sensors into a corner or further towards the edge, the, the ratio among them would shift. It was not consistent at different places under the light. It was not consistent from one light to the next. I had the paid version. I was able to select all the different options and all the rest of that. But there's reasons on the technical side where it's it's really challenging thing to do. On the first hand, you have all of these issues whenever you're trying to convert LUX to PPFD. LUX is a measure of brightness and PPFD is a measure of photon density. Okay, so I've heard um, both sides of that. I've heard that you can't, you can't um, what's the word, kind of do an equation to get from one to the other. But then I've heard other people say that it, that it is comparable. Well, let me explain why. Red photons are not as bright as blue photons. Um. So, you know, to the plant, red photons are actually the best kind of photons for photosynthesis, the most efficient photons for photosynthesis. But for a measure of locks, they're less bright than a blue 
photon. So in order to be able to, to move from a measure of brightness to a measure of PPFD, you have to know exactly the ratio of all of the different sort of spectral ranges. You have to know the exact spectral output of the fixture that you're testing. And of course, we do know the exact spectral output of the sun. So you can make that conversion pretty well with the sun it becomes very, very difficult with artificial sources of lighting. With single color spectrum light sources, you can sort of dial that in. But LEDs are, these grow lights are almost all using a, a mix of different color temperatures in the full spectrum diodes, plus supplemental red diodes, um, sometimes supplemental UV and IR diodes. And, you know, if you want to really accurately be able to, to translate from LUX to PPFD, you need to know the exact spectral output within the, the PAR, the EPAR range, or whatever range that you're interested in measuring. And, you know, the far red photons don't give out any light whatsoever. So you can't do EPAR conversions from LUX to, to PPFD. Okay. Those are just sort of basic challenges whenever you're trying to use a LUX meter to transfer to PPFD. If you've got a good LUX meter and you know a lot about the light that you're using, then you know you can figure out the, the ratio there. But then we enter, when you're talking about the phone apps, you're entering into the issue that a, a phone camera is not a good LUX sensor. So now you have to sort of compromise on the quality even of the LUX sensor. And your phone's going to measure LUX and then try to do some conversions based on what it expects the, the density or sort of the distribution of the spectral output to be and spit out a number. It's not able to compensate for light from different angles. And that's one of the other big challenges of sort of the, the grow tent scenario. We all grow in these tents that are pretty small with reflective walls, meaning a lot of light comes in at a low angle and it won't appear as bright to the, the lux sensor, even though it's still a photon like striking a surface. So you have to make compensations. And, you know, that's a challenge with PPFD sensors too. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, even the cheap quantum sensors don't work well because they don't do a good compensation for the low angle light. Um, if you're outside and there's just like one sun in the sky that's responsible for the light, then, you know, understanding the, the particular angle of attack is less important. Um, but with a distributed light source relatively close to the sensor that um, in reflective walls, there's light bouncing at this sensor from all sorts of different angles. And there's light hitting the plants from all sorts of different angles. And so you really want to know that that combined total of it. But no, this is, I, I, you know, and I feel bad because I don't, I, 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 a lot of people use these and there's a, a company of nice people that are, are, you know, developing this. I just don't, I don't. Um, okay, well, so wait. Those are my thoughts. I know this is going to sound stupid, especially after you just gave such a good explanation, but is there anything that this measurement is good for? You know, it will work best in the center of your grow space. You're not going to be able to get reliable readings as you move it sort of towards any of the edges, but you may be able to, to get some sense of how powerful your light is sort of right in the center. The closer the light is to the canopy. So this will work a lot better with an HPS, which is just like one bulb that's pretty high hung. It'll work terribly with a like LED bar array that's hung like 12 inches above the canopy. So just be aware of those limitations. Hanging height is going to be a big challenge for it. And, you know, it's, it's going to be most reliable right in the center of the space. Well, there you go, folks. The Photone app. Still up in the air. Coco says he's skeptical. He's not sold on it. And I think to be fair, to be fair to Shane, I don't think that he said that even in his, even in his video or, or post, I don't think that he said that it's an accurate measurement. I think that he said that, I don't know. I'm going to have to go. Yeah. Back. I, th I think he said that it was. My, my concern really was what happened when I moved it around within the test area and seeing how much it would sort of vary from the, the quantum sensor than the Apogee SQ500 you know, where they would be 
close to each other at one place after sort of setting all the adjustments that I could to sort of get them to be close, then move them out to the corner. And then the, the photon app is sort of much higher than the, the Apogee. And then in the, the other side along the broad edge, the photon app is much lower than the Apogee. And back in the middle, they're the same. And it's like, well, mm, what do I do with this? I mean, how do you how do you sort of approach that problem? The other thing is, I don't think I would have been, it took a while to figure out sort of the right settings to get it close. And if I hadn't had the Apogee SQ500 there sort of as verification, I, I felt like I wouldn't be confident at all that I had set up the settings correctly for my fixture. And when it worked well under one setting for one fixture, under another setting, it, it was off again. It wasn't the same ratio. So a grain of salt in, in the best case. And again, I think that even in the best of, of cases, it is difficult to measure light in a reflective space inside a grow tent with plants. I don't try to do that. I measure light in a reflective space in a setup test area that I can access from above and drag the sensor around and, and not interfere with the position of the walls or anything else, not cast a shadow and not be absorbing photons. And, and all of that really matters if you want to get an accurate reading. I mean, if you really are trying to sort of dial it in right up to the maximum or whatever. So even in the best of times, I don't, I don't drag my sensors into my grow tent. I use my own PAR tests and I know what the density will be at different heights away from the, the, the fixture and at different power readings based on that PAR test data because it's relatively easier to sort of get good data about the light coming out of a fixture in that controlled setting than it is once you actually put the plants into the space. So that's what I recommend for all home growers growing their lights in, you know, single fixture tents, especially. Almost all the PAR maps are going to be done in a single fixture tent or a single fixture space like that with reflective walls. Uh, find a good one. I try to do good ones and use the data that that was measured in that test uh, as your sort of guide about what kind of densities you can expect in different dimmer levels and different um, hanging heights. It's really important to get a PAR test that's from the same space that you're running the fixture in because the size of the coverage area makes a tremendous difference. I want to ask about Apogee and Dr. Bruce Bugby. What's his relationship? I know you, you're familiar and you've done shows with him, if I'm not mistaken. What is his role over there at Apogee? I mean, he has a role. I'm not entirely sure what the, what the particulars of that are, but he has a, a, a role um, and he is uh, like the head scientist or one of the lead scientists. Or, okay, or that's what like I that. figured, right? Because he's yeah. really, really... He's really, really educated, and Apogee is a big company. Um, and I'm thinking that they probably have him on the team. For yeah, I mean, I think, sensors, but I think it may be even more than that, to be honest with you. But I, I'm not entirely sure what his relationship is. Yeah, with I don't the know if it's like the Apogee. owner or whatever, but I did want to share right. this for the longest time. Whenever I'm not in the studio to this day, in fact, to this day, I will use my Apogee MIC96K USB microphones. Yeah. I thought that it was just a different company, you know, when you, when no, you, it's the same company, it's the same company. When you manufacture a different product, you're allowed to have the same name, but I saw the logos were the same one day and yeah. I went, holy shit, dude, they make really good microphones. They have the MIC pluses now. Sorry, we're getting into yeah. audio cast gear cast, but they have the yeah, MIC cool. pluses, but I got the old school MIC 96 Ks, man, they are fucking awesome. They're the best digital microphone that I've ever, I've ever invested in and they're still going. Yeah, no, I mean, a lot of these companies that make products that, that we use um, also make products for sort of a lot of other industries. Um, Apogee is certainly one, you know, AC Infinity is as well, or a stereo company, and then got into computer cooling and, and came to horticulture much later. Most Shit, growers man. just think when of them I as a horticultural up, company. When I fucking picked them up two years ago, they yeah. had the cloud line series and that's it. Now look at them. They're fucking, they got right. tents and fucking ratchets. And yeah, stuff. it's a it's a growth industry. And once they sort of established themselves as a brand in the industry, they decided to to sort of broaden their portfolio. Um, 
I've been interested in watching that because their background is in fans. I mean, and they grew their reputation as a company in doing fans, um, <laughs> cooling fans primarily for stereos and for computer equipment. Yep. And that's where their research and engineering sort of strengths are and all the rest of that. Once, you know, their fans became very popular in the horticultural space, they started to cater to that crowd. But it's interesting. And you see a company with a strong sort of background like that in, in one fairly specific product niche that has a lot of different applications, really broadly diversify in one of their markets. It's interesting to see sort of the new equipment and, and if it's going to meet their previous standards and sort of um, establish and, and further their brand reputation or uh, challenge it. That's always the biggest from sort of a, a marketing perspective in business. What, what, what is the concern? Yep, that's exactly right, man. But yeah, I did want to talk to talk to Bruce at some point especially if he had any hand in the microphone, obviously for the light sensors, but if he had any hand in the microphones. Uh, no, um, you know, I, I don't think that side of it is, is his purview. I although I may, I may not know everything that he's involved in, but um, he's also a professor at Utah State and um, leads the, the research team there. It's very common for, you know, people to have academic positions and, do a lot of work with industry or be involved in corporations in that same sort of space. So he's on both sides of that. A lot of people understand sort of his work that he publishes through his research team at Utah State. So yeah, there you go, everybody. Shoot, we did, we did it. We made it to the top of the hour. And uh, I hope for this educational April, we did a good job talking to you about scaling up. Are you happy that you're a home grower? Are you trying to get into large scale? Uh, write me and let me know. Follow me on Instagram, of course, at Growcast. Hit us up anywhere. Get in membership, of course. DM me on Discord. I'm in there every single day in the voice chat and all that good stuff. Growcastpodcast.com slash membership. Coco, buddy, thank you for coming today, man. Um, anything you want to shout out before we hop off here? Upcoming grow challenges, giveaways. My audience loves your giveaways. Giveaways. Oh, we're doing a big one, dude. We're doing the, the Photon Tech XT 1000 watt CO2 Pro this month on 420. That's our grower love giveaway this month. It's going to take um, most in time for that. Everybody's going to hear this like about a week, I want to say, before 420. Yeah. So you head over to the deals and discounts page on Cocoa for Cannabis to sign up for that. This is our grower love giveaway. We always do a grower love giveaway where we just get a, a, something from a sponsor and we give it away. There's almost sort of no obligation to, to um, sign up. You give us an email address that we will only use if we contact you know, because you won. And then, you know, you can follow a bunch of different accounts from people in our community to get extra chances. That's how we sort of spread the grower love around the community. So, yeah, head on over there, log on for this. This is a huge, uh, it's like a $1,600 light. It's the top end fixture in the Photon Tech line. It's one of the sort of badassiest grow lights that exist on the market. Man, so man. take it down. Um, cast list. I want to see a Growcast listener take that one down. Go enter. Yeah, take, take it down. Take it down. Come sign up for that. Um, and, you know, we're also starting the Spring Auto Flower Challenge um, on 420 on uh, April 20th here. They're just in a you know week or so. And um, that's also free to join. We're going to be doing a bunch of giveaways in that. The prize sponsor there is Magobi, and they do rosin presses and trim trays and grow lights that we're going to be giving away to participants in the Spring Auto Flower Challenge. And if you don't grow auto flowers, we do have a photo period group in the Spring Auto Flower Challenge. So everybody's welcome. Sign up for that on cocoforcannabis.com forward slash challenge. Fuck yeah, man. Super excited about uh, that giveaway. You guys go enter that. Um, that thousand watt is a is a big boy. Um, yeah, this is a this is a beast, man. He, he, I, you know, I I know somebody running that in a four by four, and um, I think they got it like thirty percent power, forty percent power, something with eight bars. It's a beast of a light, and it's the one that you know the ten bars in that. You were talking about the magnets earlier. You don't have to run it with all ten bars. You can just run it with eight bars, with six bars, with four bars, with one bar if you want. So it's sort of flexible like that. But it's just a big badass light, and I'm sad I can't use it myself. But some other grower is going to be really excited. Cool, dude. Super, super cool. I appreciate you, Coco, for everything you do. Uh, coming out to the meetup doing so much content with us. I uh, love everything that's going on at Coco for Cannabis. A lot of crossover and 
um, it's awesome to have worked with a content creator for so long and, you know, just you now become my personal friend and just want to thank you for everything, buddy. Really appreciate you. Absolutely, Jordan. I much grower love right back at you. I, I certainly consider you a personal friend as well. And yeah, let's, let's keep growing together, right? Yeah, let's do another meetup and uh, we can literally grow together. We'll come trade cuts or something next time. You heard it. Here. Absolutely. I really enjoyed that. Definitely. We'll do some co-branded thing. I'll put out the, the word on the Cocoa for Cannabis Network and, and we'll get some of uh, some of our community over there as well. I, I think everybody would love to, to do a hangout like that. So. that so cool. I'm down. Stay tuned for that, everybody. This is it. It's Dr. Coco and Jordan River signing off saying be safe out there, everybody, and grow smarter. Grow or love, everyone. That's our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in again. I appreciate every one of you listeners. I'm glad that we here at Growcast can help you in your garden a little bit. Shout out to all the listeners. Shout out to all the members in the order of cultivation. I love you guys. Helping growers one-on-one succeed. We have a very steadfast and positive community, so I cannot thank you guys enough. Before we wrap it up, of course, I want to give some love to Purity Coffee and tell you about our promo with Purity Coffee, the best organic lab tested coffee you can find code growcast will save you 20 percent at puritycoffee.com and by using the code actually you got to send me a snapshot uh, of you using the code you are entered to win coffee tree seeds that's right i'm ordering up these coffee tree seeds and i'm going to send them out to uh two lucky winners i want to say i think we said two lucky winners we'll get some seeds so you can grow your own coffee tree you won't be getting a yield don't get me wrong growing coffee is tough but it's a really cool house plant and uh shout out to purity coffee for making the the high quality shit it's the good stuff you don't want to be drinking mids coffee okay upgrade from the mids lab tested maximum cgas those are chlorogenic acids that's antioxidants baby mold free pesticide free puritycoffee.com code growcast thank you all appreciate you guys hope you're doing incredible things in your garden you know where to find me got lots of good content headed your way all right love you all have a great day and we'll see you next time bye bye